everybody, and welcome to the Maurice Brown Show. Welcome a friend to the Maurice Brown Show, a director and producer who flips the crime scene drama formula on its head. He's the creator of the faith-based crime series, Vindication. Vindication, that took the Christian entertainment world by storm two years ago, and now He's back with season two, ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, please welcome the very talented film director, Jared O'Flaherty. What's up, Jared? How are you? Hey, Maurice. Good to be back on the show, man. And, and we sure appreciate all that you have done in uh, promoting the show, supporting it. You've had a lot of our people on and uh, we, we love Maurice Brown. Well, man, I, I, I love you guys, man. I absolutely love the show. Uh, Vindication back for season two. A lot of excitement in the air. There's a lot to to unpack here as we get ready for the second season. Um, but uh, tell us, you know, actually a little bit about Vindication, Jared, and for those that have been watching but may not know the the actual history of Vindication and how it began. Yeah, so Vindication started as a short film. Uh, our first episode, our pilot, you call it now, was just meant to be a standalone, one-time crime drama short film. Uh, we did a festival run uh, with it and you know, got into some festivals and, and won top prize. Other festivals uh, didn't get accepted, so we really didn't know what we had there. And as we came to the end of that festival run, a distribution company came in and said, hey, we, we'd like to try to get this out there, maybe on some streaming services or whatnot. And so they did that, and, and within a couple of months came back and said, hey, we want to see another episode of this show. Uh, what another episode? What are you talking about? This is, this is over with, you know? So uh, anyway, <laughs> we uh, we did another one, you know, what, what at the time we called Vindication 2, right? And uh, once yes. that one was done and came out, people came back and said, hey, we want to see we want to see more of these. So that's kind of how it got started. And we ended up doing a full season. And then last summer got the green light to do a season two. So we spent the last year, most of 2020 and early 2021 shooting Vindication season two. And that's what uh, comes out a, a week from today. Venus Monique, the star, one of the stars of Vindication, almost uh, got the time zones me messed up. Thanks, Venus, for joining us. I'm glad you got the time zones. I was down there, you know, <laughs> over the suburb. It is, it's just one hour, and I, I, I still never really quite got it right. So I don't know what it is about that. But Venus, thanks for uh, joining us. And you know, Todd Terry and Venus Monique are your your front liners of Vindication, and they'll be back for season two. Glad to know that those two are back. Can't wait to see how the this the second season. Uh, and Steve Mokate, of course, is going to be back as well. One of the headline guys. What's up, Steve? Um, so I, tell us a little bit about how you were able to, you know, corral. Todd Terry and Venus Monique onto your show. Yeah, so obviously they are in season one, so uh, yeah, I didn't have to corral them for the second season. Uh, I met Todd at a at a, uh, a an event here in the Dallas Fort Worth area for uh, uh, people that are a part of the entertainment industry, part of the arts, uh, uh, that were also believers. And he was on a panel of of actors in the area, and afterwards I just kind of went up and tapped on the shoulder, said, hey, what does it take to get a guy like you to come work in a small independent production? I mean, he's got a great resume of lots and lots of big projects that he has worked on. And you know, he told me that you know, he, he's open to, to working projects that he believes in. And, and if it's got a good script and that sort of thing, then he would be very interested in, in taking a look at it. So that's how we met. Uh, he never auditioned for it. Uh, it was just, wow, we're so thankful to have this guy willing to work with us. And, and that was in episode one. Yeah. You know, and as I mentioned about how the series kicked off, once you know, we started doing more episodes and they, I honestly, when I looked at the first episode, I thought it was a standalone and it was over with. And, and the distributors and others said, well, what about this detective? Could he do other cases? Oh, OK. Yeah, I, I guess he could. So, uh, you know, Todd obviously was was the link that kept all of that connected. And then Venus, when we were at one of the film festivals that I mentioned earlier, uh, she was actually hosting it. She was the MC for this film festival. And she was one of the first actresses that I got connected with here in Texas. And I told her, I said, hey, you know, if, if this thing keeps going, I think we can find a place for you. I'd love for you to be a part of it. And, you know, she told me at the time you hear lots of things like that from directors, lots of chatter, and then nothing ever comes of it. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, if I say something to someone like that, it's very important to me that I follow through with it. So uh, she did record an audition tape. It was the only person to audition for the role of Chris. Uh, I just wanted to see it ahead of time before we committed to it for many, many episodes. And uh, yeah, it worked out. So both of them I met at events as opposed to traditional auditioning or casting channels. Uh, Maggie, Jenny says, I love how God opened doors. You didn't even know we were in the hallway. <laughs> so, yeah. You never know, Maggie. You absolutely never know how God is going to work. I can tell you that right now. Um, the anticipation, Jared, for season two is pretty huge. And, and, and I think you're going to see people. We were talking about it a little bit before we got started today that people are, are, are going to start to compare the effect of vindication on the faith-based world similarly to the chosen. And, and there's a popular term out there for people that love watching vindication that we're, we, we, we are called Vindies. <laughs> because there's a huge following for it. And it's kind of one of those deals, Jarrett, where it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. You know, when, when you don't see something, it kind of goes to the recesses of your mind. You kind of forget it. But when it's back in front of you, then the fervor begins again. Uh, what was the, the mindset in, in the marketing aspect of Vindication leading up to season two? Well, you hit on a great, great point there. Uh, you know, you made the comparison to The Chosen and how it has just exploded and gone everywhere. Yeah. And and Vindication, uh, you know, it's 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 an honor to be considered in that same sentence or in that same conversation, uh, considering the, the size of our production and everything. But at the same time, how many other Christian series are out there? How many have come out in the last eight or nine months? Right. That's I, right. I, I That's don't right. think it's a very long list. We'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, but, but you mentioned the marketing and, and what they have done. I think the success of Vindication, as if we'll see other seasons, how far it will reach, it lies more with people like you, Maurice, and with those Vindies that you mentioned, the fans. <laughs> it lies more with them than it does with me and with the cast and crew, right? You say, yes. well, how does that make sense? I mean, yeah, we've, we've done, we, we have to create a decent product or, or else it, it's dead in the water. But once we have done that, the success, what distribution companies and exhibitors and streamers and all that kind of stuff, they want to see how the audience responds. So if people watch, yeah. they go, wow, I really enjoyed that show. That was great. And that's all they do with it then Vindication is going to go and, and into the abyss and disappear, right? What yeah. has made The Chosen so successful, other than them making a, a really strong product, is that people who watched it have been vocal about it. You know, they yeah. talk about it. They share about it. They comment when The Chosen posts stuff. You know, Dallas Jenkins goes live in his studio, you know, with his, his coffee cup and starts talking. <laughs> and all of a sudden, man, everybody's on. They're sharing. Yeah. They're people respond in that way. And that's why, uh, in a big part, the show has been successful. So as far as Vindication is concerned, you know, uh, maybe people watch it. You were mentioning earlier how there's a big, big fan base. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of them I don't hear from, meaning that they're not as vocal as perhaps the chosen fans. So th that's really going to determine it. And I think having a, a, a hashtag, a term like Vindies kind of gives people something to belong to and says, hey, I'm one of those, you know. And, and maybe right now there's only 10 or 20 of them. We don't know. Maybe there's hundreds, whatever. But giving that type of term, you know, getting to throw that on a T-shirt maybe here in the future uh, gives people something that they can belong to and something that they're proud to be a part of. Well, I, and, and, I, and I honestly believe, uh, Jared, and I said this when, when I first came upon Vindication, and then I saw The Chosen, and I didn't know The Chosen was out there, and I watched both programs, and you kind of alluded to this. It's like there's not a lot of faith-based you know, uh, projects out there that are dropping, that are that are out there. But I honestly believe th that those two are the best out there. And and vindication. Let me say this: as far as a crime series goes, it, in in the faith based world, it's the best program I've ever seen. Period, bar none. And I and I I one hundred percent mean that because it's so realistic, but it's going to the light. It's, it's like you're talking about the same hard-hitting subject matter that a law and order would discuss or cover or an NCIS, you know. Uh, but there's there's nothing left at the end where you're, you're taking the viewer somewhere and you're taking them to goodness. 
and and they're they're going to be baited in because the storyline is so well done and and i i'm i'm interested to know what was your motivation jared when you when you came up with vindication was it just something that you just wanted to talk about or was it something in your mind where you were thinking it, we we got to come up with a better way to draw the lost in and and get them saved. Yeah. So going into vindication, there are probably a handful of I, I don't know what you call them uh, checkpoints, objectives, whatever that I've always tried to hit on on all the episodes or in the approach. You know, as far as the faith message is concerned, that's not something that I sit down and say, okay, let's take a Bible passage or let's take a sermon and then let's wrap a story yeah. around it. That, 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 yeah. That's not the approach that right. I take on vindication. Early on when we were starting season one, there was kind of an initiative put forward of, hey, why don't you take the Ten Commandments, you know, and do one episode on each of them? And I just thought, that's a terrible, let, let's not do that, <laughs> you know? No. That, that, that's not how, how we do it. I, I want to tell engaging stories, realistic stories, uh, intriguing stories. And naturally, because of, uh, of me being a believer and that being the central part of, of who I am in my life yeah. and my identity, it's naturally going to come out into those stories. It has Absolutely. to, you know, yeah. uh, you'll yeah. see in season two, there's some episodes that that is, oh, that is so evident and it's, it's prominent. There's others that it's, it's very subtle, you know, and, and you might even miss it, but it's also setting up something in a later episode or it's concluding something that happened earlier. You know, it's, it's yeah, just sure. a different approach. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other things going in is anytime you sit down for an episode of vindication, I want it to be that you have no idea what you're about to be in for. Right. Yes. And, and we really do that well in season two, I think. Um, for example, uh, with the title being vindication, that sounds like someone looks guilty or they're accused and then they they're found innocent later on. Well, after we do that for three, four five episodes, people kind of catch on and go, OK, I know what to expect. This character is going to look really, really guilty, but something's going to happen and they're innocent. Well, you can't keep doing that over and over or it goes dry, you know, it goes stale. Yeah. So, uh, but at the same time, we want to stay along this theme of vindication. So we've had to change things up a bit and do things a little bit differently. So anyway, I, I just like the idea that when you hit play on one of these episodes that you don't know what you're about to see. It's not this formula uh, like television crime dramas. You know, I don't know if you've heard people have gone on YouTube and done video comparisons of all the crime dramas. And at seven minutes of every uh, crime drama, a certain, a certain thing happens. And then at 14 minutes, you know, that's when the twist occurs. And then at 33 minutes is when they circle back. And it's like a formula. Every single one of these for 20 years on 20 different networks, they've been doing the same thing. So yes, they with have. vindication, <laughs> we're, we're not going to have any of that, you know, <laughs> for better or for worse. We're going to go in and, and, you know, grab your popcorn, hold on to your seat. We're going to try to do something different each time. Well, I, I love the, the fact that you, you didn't sit down, uh, Jared, and, and try to premeditate or telegraph your, your, your aim. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, and and it's it's done with a good heart, but you know, it, people uh, see what you're doing, and you're you're overarching there, and you know, you're you're trying too hard, as it were. For I guess that might be a better way to describe it. And your show doesn't do that, and uh, I think your approach is exactly why it's so great, is because you just kind of you did it. You had an idea. The Holy Spirit dropped something into to your spirit, and you you just went with it. And I think as faith based performers. That's what we have to do. Just be open to the Holy Spirit to have him take you wherever he wants to take you. It's always going to be great if you're willing to do that. So I, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, you just you, you're, you're going with the spirit because there's nothing out there in Christian entertainment. And I, I think it's the best thing. I, I think that there are many. I've got a bunch of questions i got to ask you later. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but. I, I, I do like the fact that you're just letting the Holy Spirit guide you. I mean, I try, I'm try. i trying to do the same thing in comedy. You know, it's like I've always felt that I, I want to do the right thing, but I'm telegraphing my aim sometimes too much, and it's more about, okay, well, I'm here. Holy Ghost, take over, and let's go do Of course, I got it right, but Holy Ghost, take over. You know, don't, don't telegraph your throws, as they say in football. You want to get that defensive back looking somewhere else. So anyway, I love that approach that you take. Now, I, I, I have a show, Jared, and I'd love to hear your response to this, 
that I do periodically call the lack of diversity in faith-based films. And, and season two definitely takes on diversity in a way that is quite different from season one. What is your mindset, Jared, as a filmmaker, when, when it comes to diversity in filmmaking? Well, that's 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 a great question. We we could probably talk for an hour on that one because I, I have a lot to say on that. Uh, yeah. Let me you say what's my take or, or approach. Uh, I'll share an example. Um, when season one was out, I, I got invited onto a a show similar to this one. Uh, it was one with a, a predominantly African American audience. I thought, hey, this is awesome. This is great, you know. Yes. So I get on there with the host, and we're talking everything, and and he's saying, hey, you know, let's go ahead and show the trailer for season one. And, uh, and, and then we'll get into this conversation. I'm sitting there live watching the trailer. And as it gets in 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, I'm for the first time I'm realizing, boy, I'm seeing a whole lot of light skinned folks in this TV show, you know? And then my mom goes, okay, please, can we, can we have a little diversity in here? Oh, okay, I think I saw, you know? And uh, it gets yeah. to the end and I was, it was the first time I'd ever paid attention to that was as this thing was was playing you know and i yeah. realized oh man that was a very very white trailer that i just watched you know <laughs> and uh, i get back on and the host and he was being funny about it he's like man love your show you're doing a great thing you know maybe if you do a season two can we maybe get a, a black fella to walk by in the background or something you know uh, just, just for <laughs> once maybe not tip his hat to the camera and, and we all had a good laugh you know um yes but you know it, it was one of those things that in that moment it's kind of like I think I should pay attention to it a little bit more than I did. the first season. We were just trying to get a show together. We were just trying to cut something. So if somebody would audition, somebody would show up, Hey, let's go with it. And I wasn't really even uh, thinking about that. You know, um, I, I will say also our show takes place in a, a te small Texas town. Uh, if you've ever been to Texas and ever been to some of the small towns, uh, the racial demographics of those towns very much match what season one of our show was. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, yes, so it's kind of like, well, it, it is accurate to what the town would be like, you know, and in and, and, and scenes where I needed extras and stuff, the people that are in my local community and my social circles, they all tend to be lighter colored people. That's just the demographic of the area we live in. You know, it, it's not yeah. so much a, oh, this is what I like better. Or this, it, it was just what what's available. So going into season two, you know, it, it was something I just wanted to make sure I do because our audience ver uh, obviously has a great diversity in it. You know, and I, I want to make sure that they're all represented, you know, uh, and, and again, I could talk about it for an hour. Lots of other things, you know. For example, uh, uh, storylines that that feature that are around, you know, black culture, African American culture. How well am I going to be at telling those stories, you know? And it, yes. am I going to know how to tell those accurately? And then it goes, well, you need to reach out and get some other. And suddenly it gets big. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we're very uh, economical. Uh, resources are limited. Production where we're just trying to get it done. And uh, we may not have some of the luxuries to expand and do those things um, that aren't just sitting across the street from us, so to speak. So anyway, lots more we could talk. Maybe the next time you have one of those shows, you can get me on there because I do a lot of casting and writing and those things. And, and and if there's anything at a high level, I could say it's that sometimes there's a lot more factors that go into it than what you see in the end. You know what I'm saying? L lots of decisions. Like I said, I put out anybody, please come out and be an extra in our show. And the 30 people that show up are all white, you know, it's like, hey, I would have taken anybody from anything that showed up. And that's just who we got. So, well, I, I'm one of your biggest uh, fans out there. And I try to get the word out to as many people as I can. And I, and I think the that the African-American community uh, pretty much unaware of vindication. I, I try to and I, I have friends of all colors, but I try to let my friends know, hey, you got to watch this show, man. You, you've just got to, if you love the Lord, the only thing that matters is the point that's being conveyed. If you are a faith man and you watch this show, it won't even matter to you whether or not there's any diversity. It, it, did, it didn't matter to me either uh, when I watched it, but I'm glad that you were willing to discuss it and, and get into it because it is an issue. It's a separate issue. I just wanted to touch on it briefly. Um, and, and Venus Monique says, I've seen that a lot of the casting calls are open ethnicity. 
and, and that is definitely Venus. I might even have you on the show as well. You got some good points there, but uh, yeah. It, but thank you, Jared, for be, uh, being open to discussing that briefly. And I will definitely have you on a show in the future. Now, Jared, let's get to the good stuff. <laughs> what can you tell us about season two? Well, what can we talk about? Goodness, uh, you know, season one wrapped up a lot of the storylines uh, yeah. that were were going on. A lot of them got wrapped up. Uh, one that didn't get wrapped up, in my opinion, was this uh, romantic interest that the character Kevin had in Chris. Uh, you ah. saw a little bit of that at the end of the season. I thought, you know, we never brought a conclusion to that. So okay. that's something going into season two. I thought, you know, what? we need to uh, we need to touch on that. What has happened there? Um, season two takes place about two years after the conclusion of season one. So okay. it, it's a little ways down the road. Um, all of our characters are at a different phase of life. Uh, you're not going to show up in season two and have Travis, you know, uh, bossing Chris around as his trainee and those yeah. sort of things. People have stepped forward in life. Becky's in a new place. Katie's in a new place. Uh, same for Chris and Travis as well. So, um, and I think that's good, you know? I mean, people who enjoyed season one, uh, we're going to give you the characters you love, same storytelling, but things have progressed and we're, we've opened or turned a new chapter in the storylines. Yeah, and I, 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 there's there's so much, you know, there to unpack going into season two. And I, I don't want to ask anything that would, you know, put you in a compromising position of giving away too much information. But I know that you do have some uh, actors that you've added to the cast in, in Gary Nation, uh, Candace Kirkpatrick, and, uh, of course, Cameron Arnett and, and, and T.C. Stallings. And it looks like you have ramped up the intensity as, as if see, and, and this is just based on my hunch that I'm getting as if season one wasn't intense enough. It looks like you've even ramped it up another notch in season two. Would that be correct? We tried to, you know, uh, yeah. there, there will be some episodes that are maybe more on the drama side, more on the storytelling, more on the character development. And yeah. then there will be some other moments that are, are bigger and more intense, you know, um, I, like I said, I don't like to follow a formula. Most crime dramas on TV, it's always a murder every episode, you know, and that's really a way to raise the stakes. Uh, someone got murdered, you know. Well, in our little town of East Bank, I don't think they're, they're going to have a murder every week, you know. <laughs> Small towns like that, it's a very rare occurrence, you know. So uh, while the stakes on that level may be different as far as I, I think you're going to care about the characters more and what's going on with them is going to matter more. So in that sense, the, the stakes have been raised. And, and yeah, a little more intensity there. I had a chance earlier uh, this summer to uh, speak with Jeff Fenter, Amanda Erickson, and Macy McLean, who were in a couple of hard-hitting episodes that were quite uh, substantive from season one. Uh, this year, of course, as I mentioned, you've added Cameron Arnett and T.C. Stallings. Uh, tell, us, tell us what it was like working with Cameron and TC. Those guys were ultimate professionals, you know. Um, they showed up ready to do the work, ready to go. And what was so nice about working with them is they were huge fans of the show and what we were doing, you know. Uh, they, they came to set not as, hey, I'm an actor and I'm here and, and, and I'm going to do this big thing. I'm like, hey, I'm a fan of this show. I love what you're doing. How can I help out? And I, I just thought that was a, a very neat approach, and it made it great for everyone. I mean, they just instantly jumped in. We're, we're friends with everybody. They're horsing around, you know, having a good time. And uh, that was neat because, yeah, Cameron and, and TC have both done some, some big projects, some well-known projects that have been in many theaters and, and all over the country and, in, you know, multiple places. So what's it going to be like when they come to, you know, a, a smaller independent production in Texas and uh, yeah, they showed up and like, hey, we're fans of this show. We're so happy to be here. And it was it was great. And I think the performances in the end, uh, audiences will be very uh, uh, just uh, struck by by what they see and, and they'll love it. And, and as I've said, and I have to say it again, I, I think your your filmmaking takes on the, the subjects in in the faith based community that. A lot of faith-based filmmakers are, quite frankly and honestly, uh, afraid to address because they don't know how. Maybe they don't want to mess up, mess it up, or just not quite knowing how to handle it. So they don't do it, and they stay with the hunky dory, peachy keen stories. Which there's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But you know, life isn't always hunky dory and peachy keen, as you and I both well know. There, there are issues 
that Christians go through, that they have to manufacture through. And it's just as hard as people that don't know God. We just happen to know who he is and showing how God being incorporated with, you know, the thick weeds uh, is is what it's all about. And your show, your show does that. You, you're willing to go there, as it were. Uh, and because you've done this uh, so effectively, um, I want to ask you this. Do you think that there's any way possible that because your show's done so well that it could be somewhat of a, a template for shows going forward? Uh, certainly, yeah, I, I would think so. Um, I, I can't say that we had a template going into this of, oh, wow, I love how that Christian show handled tough issues. Let's go do that in Vindication. So yeah. perhaps other filmmakers can look at Vindication and say, hey, how, how did they handle this or how did they do that? But, you know, you, you hit on a, an interesting topic about, you know, those issues that, that, that maybe sometimes get glossed over or skipped over in Christian films. I remember as a teenager, I came to Christ as a 16 year old. Right. Yeah. And, and so for me at that time, going to these church services, going to the youth group, you know, um, it was a new thing, you know, and, and I can just recall as a teenager when we would sh show up, you know, and Hey, this week we're going to talk about the four pillars of this, or we're going to go through this scripture, this and that, you know, as a 16 year old, I'm kind of like, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm a Christian. I'm glad to be here. That's interesting. But when they're like, okay, this week we're going to talk about sex. Woo. You know, I'm up in the seat. I'm paying attention. What's this preacher going to say? What's about to yeah. happen? You know, yeah. Yeah. or it's going to be about, you know, uh, can Christians drink alcohol? You know, I'm like, whoa, I'm paying attention. Right. Cause it was, yes. a, it was a hot topic that was going on in the world and it was a part of my life and, and that sort of thing, you know? And, and I just know for me, it, it got my attention, you know? So in, in vindication, it's like, let, let's, let's tell stories that, that are going to have people sit up in their seat and the eyeballs pop open. Like, whoa, are they really going there? Like, are they really going to talk about this? Because guess what? If it's in yeah. our world, then God has, has something to say about it and he knows about it. And, you know, it's not some hidden secret that's away from God. No, he, he's, he's going to uh, pay attention to it. He, he knows what's going on. So that means there's a story that can be told there. So uh, that's kind of my approach on that. Um, you know, it's always a balancing act. I think I've said before that, you know, there are some conservative Christian film festivals that we get into, others we don't, you know. And I've always thought, well, that's kind of where I want to be is there in the middle, you know. If we're always getting into the festival because we're playing it very safe, well, then we're probably too safe. If we're always getting rejected from these festivals, then we're probably being a little bit too edgy. But as long as we stay yeah. in the middle, then I think that's, that's a good place to be. I know that season two, I'm sorry, episode two of season one, it was there was uh, – an <laughs> And for me, I, I just didn't see anything uh, over the top about it at all. It was very realistic. The the character that Macy McLean was playing uh, concerning uh, teenage sexting. Well, that's a real subject. That's that's a, a subject that parents are Christian parents have to address and deal with are experiencing. It's happening in underneath their roof, and so to say that that's inappropriate or shouldn't be addressed is not being real and that's not walking the walk of Christ because it's it's not about oh because I follow Christ I don't go through anything I don't have any problems I don't ever have to deal with any bad things no because you have Christ you can deal with all of those different things so you had uh, presented that and and you had some issues you care to expound on that a little bit season I'm sorry episode 2 from season 1 yeah you know when we were reaching out to Macy about playing that, that central character, you know, she's like, well, yeah, can I, can I take a look at the script? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to send you the script. But then I'm also calling her and saying, listen, what you're about to read may go, whoa, I don't want to be a part of this, but just know we're going to do it tastefully. You know, it, it's going to be well done. And as an actress, we're not going to ask anything of you that you're not comfortable with, you know? Right. And she read it and came back and said, Hey, I, I think this is an important topic. Uh, I, I like what you said about how it's going to be done. So, yeah, I'm in for this, you know. Um, and honestly, I, I have had a whole lot more parents reach out and say thank you for touching on that topic and, and showing some of the negative effects of it as opposed to people saying, oh, I thought that was uh, visually inappropriate or was too much. Yeah, I, I don't know that I had that. Uh, you know, we did have uh, at one time a, a festival that came back and said, wow, we love this episode. We love what you're doing. We do think it may be just a step too far for some of our core audience. 
and for that reason, we're gonna gonna pass on it for now. And I understand and respect that. I mean, I, again, I think it was tastefully done, but you know, sometimes you get in a certain setting. Like we watched the the trailer for season two uh, at our church last week, and afterwards, my teenage daughters and and wife they kind of come and go. Dad, I kind of got a little uncomfortable when a couple of those shots popped up because it was just weird to see them in church, you know? And I was like, yeah, I kind of felt it too. But again, like I mentioned earlier, you want to be right there on the edge um, just without going over, without stepping off and falling off. So, um, so yeah, so, so episode two, like I said, I, I don't have any regrets. I, I think it was tastefully done and I've had very, very few uh, pushback on it. But, you know, when you delve into dark places, sometimes you get a little, a little dirty. Well, at you, you, you know, you just count on it. You're going to get a lot. You're going to get sometimes you get quite a bit of dirt on you. But that's why we have Christ. He washes us clean because he he actually wants us to get in the muck and mire and bring out his babies. But I, I, I'll tell you, dude, it's it's interesting because when people see going back to episode two, if I just touch on it and go to another subject. But if you look at what happened there, it's like nothing was inappropriate about that scene. I mean, you handled it with a plum. You, you presented it, you showed what happens in those situations for, for, for the, the, the reality of it, but it never crossed the line. And then there are people that would criticize you for doing that, whoever it might be, I'm, because there have been criticisms, will go home and watch something that goes beyond where you stopped with no problem. And, and I'm going, what what are we really doing in Christendom? But that that being said, I love the fact, and also episode six, where you talk in season one, where you talked about uh, the uh, the situation with Jeff Venter and Am- Amanda Erickson and and the the, um, the I, what is that term called? Uh, help me help me out, Jared. I'm getting stuck here. Uh, trafficking. Trafficking. Sex trafficking. Okay, that was a subject that you 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 went dead on with, and I don't think you could have found a better actor to do that particular episode with than Jeff Fenter. That was an amazing episode. Yeah, uh, audiences typically point to that one as saying it was their favorite in uh, season one uh, was was that episode. And yeah, you know, it's interesting. You wonder how that storyline came about um, without mentioning any names. I, I had an actor that's well known in the uh, Christian world who through different channels, word got back to me that he was interested in being a part of Vindication. Yes. And, and there were others that said, we would love to get him in this show. And, and I went and looked at the roles that he had played in other films, and it was always a very squeaky clean character. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. it was the guy that had the scripture at the end and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, I, yeah, let, let's get him in Vindication. But guess what? In Vindication, he's going to look like he is, you know, out of the playground trying to manipulate a teenage, you know, we're going to make it look bad. And what was going to happen is you would never see his face until – they arrest him and they turn him around and then you see who it is. And again, it's this actor that has always played these squeaky clean roles. And you're going to yeah. go, oh, that is where the idea for that episode came about. Um, okay. So we wrote the whole script and everything. We send it to this guy. Hey, we're ready. And he said he was uncomfortable with it because of how it dove into this matter. And a few scenes he would have to shoot that he was uncomfortable. So then we're like, okay, well, we wrote this episode, you know, based on that idea. What do we do? And that's when we put out the audition and found Jeff Venter. And like you said, he, he made it better than it would have been had we done it with the original uh, intention. He, he just did a fabulous job. Well, I had Amanda Erickson on who was in that episode and played opposite Jeff in that episode. And she expressed the fact that he was such a professional because it's very intense. That was a very intense episode, and it required high professionalism to pull that off. And and she made uh, reference to the fact that Jeff made her feel so comfortable doing one scene in particular, and and and, and you know he, he, she was just able to flow just because of Jeff's presence and calming effect. Uh, and and Amanda did a great job uh, with her role, and and it just came off so well done and i i do believe that <laughs> there are a lot of episodes too where i i was just choked up at the end uh and and it was just amazing and, and i also love from the co- a comic standpoint how you have steve mokate 
and Todd Terry's character is kind of playing a, 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 a kind of a comedic, <laughs> it's, it's not over the top, of course, but there's a very slight comedic relationship <laughs> that they have in the, uh, in the episodes, and, and I, I like that part of it. I love the way that they kind of interact. Uh, and then Jordan Elsess, who was in episode eight, and you addressed another serious topic, you know, where murder was involved. And it was very hard-hitting. Jordan Elsass has gone on to, he's a part of the Superman uh, series that's on the CW right now. Congratulations to Jordan. But he did a great job in Episode 8, and, and you addressed a matter that it, it's, it's, it, was, it was just something you don't see in a lot of Christian projects. And once again, you handled it beautifully. Uh, and you care to expound on Jordan Elsass's contribution to the to the show? Yeah, so episode eight of season one is, is interesting because uh, you know, I yeah I wrote that episode and and here's how I went in. I had seen some auditions for previous episodes of some yeah. very 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 talented people. Jordan Elsass he had auditioned to be the boyfriend in episode two, opposite of Macy McLean. Yes. And uh, he was fabulous. The only issue we had is age-wise, there was about a six, seven, eight-year difference between the two of them. And we were just worried uh, that may not play well on screen, you know, that they are <laughs> yeah. you know, th this far apart in age. But I kind of put it that audition aside and said, but we need to work with this guy. Uh, Skeeta Jenkins, you know, uh, we, we know we both know of him. I think he's been on the yes, show before. Absolutely. He was a absolutely. guy I had seen and go, man, I, I got to work with this guy. Um, April Hartman was one of them. Uh, Liza Wilk was one of them. These are the different characters that show up in episode eight. Basically, I had this little stash of fabulous auditions of people I really want to work with. And then I sat down and said, okay, I need to tell a story now that I can get all these people into, right? How, yes. how can I weave all these components together? So you see that in the story, different characters start popping up and showing up and crossing paths. And that was really the intention. Now, all of them did record an audition for that one, but in most cases, they were the only tape for those individual roles because it was like, I want to work with these people. And that's how the storyline came about for episode eight, uh, uh, for better or worse. Now, my favorite episode, I'm sorry, is as uh, episode five of season one, and you kind of talked about how, you know, these little Bible studies actually result in really gossip. We just kind of mask it. Well, we need to pray for so and so. We need to pray for that person. And you know, really, we're we we've overstepped our bounds to the extent where it broke up the Bible study, <laughs> because you know, and and I, and I love the way you kind of convicted Peggy Schott's character in episode five and how you know she was just going about her quote unquote Christendom. <laughs> it's not necessarily the way that Christ had designed that thing. We allow our flesh to get kind of get in the way. You kind of busted up the Bible study there momentarily. <laughs> uh, but it, it's just something that that happens so subtly and so consistently in church all the time. You kind of touched on that and the relationship between Todd Terry's character and his daughter, I thought, was amazing. The way you kind of brought everything to a head in that episode. That episode floored me. That one brought tears. Yeah, so what can I tell you about that episode? That was the first episode in season one that I did not write. Uh, Alan Tregoning was the writer on that one. Okay. Now, he and I worked very closely together. For example, after I was on set and I filmed episode four, which at the very end of that episode, you see this uh, prayer gathering where Katie Travis is there, Becky is there, uh, Todd's there. They're actually praying over a meal, and, and Todd's character looks up at his daughter, and she's staring at him, and she's just giving him this look. Yeah. And when I was on set and we filmed that, I go back I go back because episode five was being written, and I'm like, Alan, you got to do something with this because there was this look that she gave him that had a whole lot of weight behind it. And right now in the script, we don't have anything that addresses that. So that opening scene where she's sitting on the couch reading a book, and he, you kind of see this interaction between them for the first time, and they're kind of sniping, snapping back and forth at each other. Uh, that was written because of what we saw happen in episode four. Um, you know, with Becky's character and the, the gossip at the Bible study, I mean, we, we've all you know, it's not a surprise or something that people aren't aware of that does happen from time to time. You know, the, yeah. the prayer list is also the gossip chain, you know, and, and churches obviously want to stay away from that, but it, it still happens because you got people involved. 
Um, yes. You know, some of the, the nuances in that episode that I like, you know, this women's group, those ladies that are there at the Bible study, uh, they're all so well put together. They have nice shirts on and their earrings and nails done and all this. They so come beautiful. Us, you it, saw, it's just yeah. wonderful. And when uh, the young lady who felt betrayed by the group, when she comes in basically to tell them off, she's got like sweatpants on, some big old boots on them. You know, she, her hair is a mess and all this kind of thing. It was kind of like she didn't care about the outward appearances anymore. She came there and to be truthful and to be honest and to say what she needed to say. And I just thought that was a neat visual representation of that, that maybe, you know, they get there to that group. They want to look a certain way and put on a certain appearance. And that lady was the only one being honest and truthful. It just showed up where she was at. Well, I, I never got the impression that she was very trusting of the group anyway. I mean, she was there, but her, the look in her eyes were like suggesting that she didn't like, the tone and tenor of the conversations during the group. I mean, the entire episode, I mean, before she exploded. And she exploded because it was finally revealed that her spit suspicions were accurate, like, you ladies don't have the right spirit. Right. I mean, because she, she was never comfortable. That, that was the vibe that I got in, in watching that episode. But uh, Yeah, I think com comfortable is the word, that she was not comfortable in that group, probably because she had some stuff going on, but she's hearing, you know, these other prayer requests and like, can I really share about what's <laughs> really going on right now and, and then not have it, you know, pop up in all the other uh, conversation circles around town. Uh, one other thing I like to note about that episode is, you know, Becky – in hearing that prayer request and then going home and sharing it with her husband, I don't think it was something done maliciously. I don't think it was gossip. I think it was well-intentioned. She really wanted to help this young lady, and an idea popped in to share it with her husband. But then obviously in the end, it comes back and, and backfired on her, you know, that, that this young lady felt betrayed in her group and, and so forth. And I just like that type of storytelling instead of black and white of, oh, yeah, Becky did something she absolutely – should not have done and then it backfired no it's she was trying to help you know she was tr trying to do a good thing but it probably wasn't the best no and i think sometimes we as christians we try too hard we we try to overstep our bounds and it does become meddling you know and it was it's supposed to be a, a safe place when you're having that type type of intimate gathering and she broke the code even yeah. though it was her husband, even though she was trying to help, you know, we, we get all of that, but she was also sacrificing, you know, some privacy there because Todd Terry's character, you know, uh, Travis, you know, was trying to let her know, look, I, I can't go doing that kind of thing. I know you want to help, but I can't go around, you know, doing that kind of thing, babe. So he kind of warned her that it wasn't a good idea, and he did it anyway. Yeah. And she pushed him into it as well. You know, she didn't just, oh, okay, all right, never mind. No, she kept nudging and pushing and, and then it backfired later on. So I, and, and what, what is the, the, the actress's name that plays the daughter? Emma L. Roberts. Dude, let me tell you something. You mentioned the look that she gave at the end of episode four. Dude, let me tell you something. There's something very haunting and excellent about her acting. I, I, I mean, it's it's like she's very present. And it, it has a huge effect. Every scene that she's in, she has a huge impact. And she doesn't have to have a lot of verbiage, per se. It, it, I mean, although she's, she's a good actress on, on every level, the her acting is so strong, dude. <laughs> I mean, she's really good actress. What about the end of episode eight, uh, where she comes into the garage, you know, to share with her dad? Oh my gosh! About the amazing. Results of seeing the Utterly doctor, amazing. you know, and yeah. Yeah, that's one that I think people point to as as maybe a second or third, you know, very top uh, favorite moments. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and what a way to end an episode because then you know, oh, what's the next episode gonna? What was that about? I gotta yeah. know what what caused that emotion out of her. But yeah, that's a scene too that that was was very powerful that she she nailed. She is a is quite an exceptional actress, and you know she kind of she actually kind of grows on you, even though she's like in the central theme being in the family of 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 uh, of Travis. She just grows on you, you know. And you just kind of go, whoa, whoa, you know. It kind of leaves you 
thinking about what she just said or the look that she just gave, it adds so much to the storyline. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up. I, I, I thought she was quite impressive, quite yeah. impressive. And, and if you paid attention to the trailer we put out for season two, we're, we're very fortunate that, you know, the cast members that were a part of season one that played the essential roles, uh, they, they all show up in season two. Uh, so we didn't have to do any recasting or, you know, uh, get rid of anyone or write them out of the story or anything like that. So uh, we'll, we'll get to see more of, of the characters that we grew to know in season one. Awesome stuff. Now, now, let's get to some more good stuff here. The thing that we're all wa waiting to hear from you is when and where can we see season two? Yes. Oh, the, the big question. And it's, uh, I wish it was just a super easy answer, but um, September 1st, probably at midnight. Uh, well, that's next Wednesday, a week from today. Um, 11 p.m. probably Central Time Zone, maybe a little earlier on Tuesday night on the, the West Coast. On Pureflix, their streaming service, subscribe. It's subscription based. You 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 know sign up as a subscriber. I think they have a, a week or month trial that you can get in for free. But the first two episodes of season two uh, will premiere that evening or that morning, whichever you want to call it, uh, on Pureflix, and that'll be the place to see the the next two episodes. And uh, every week after on Wednesday, they're going to release a subsequent episode. So we'll have a week to digest what we've just seen, maybe rewatch it, and then talk about what's ahead, what's coming and see the next episodes. Uh, Redeem TV, which is a production partner with us on it, they're a uh, donation-based streaming service. They will also have season two uh, with the same release schedule as Pure Flix, uh, just a couple of days behind. So if you want to see it first, Pure Flix is the place to be. Redeem TV for their donors will have it uh, as well. And then for those that uh, want to purchase it, want to get the whole season, uh, that, that'll be coming soon where you can go out and uh, drop a few dollars, but sit down and binge watch the whole season uh, through some some different means. So the purchase option will be there for those that are impatient and wanna wanna jump to to the through it all. I, I like the way that you're doing this, Jared, because it's actually quite similar to the way the Chosen has been dropping their their uh, episodes as well, and it and it's it's creating more uh, excitement and anticipation to see you know each episode. You know, and because you got your Vindies out there, dude, you got your Vindies and the Vindies are like going to be all over it. The way that you're doing this, we're going to be all over this. So well, good. Well, I hope in between we're, we're talking about it. We're online and chit chatting about characters and storylines and what did that mean and what's coming next and so forth. So. So, Jared, this has been a great convo. I want to thank you for being on the show. Is there any advice out there that you can leave young filmmakers that are out there thinking about making this a career choice? Woo. Career choice, that, that, that one's tricky. Um, yeah. Uh, because it's a very competitive <laughs> industry. It's a fun job to do. It's, it's hard work, but it's also fun. And so that means there are a lot of people that want to do it, you know? Um, you know, my advice to those young filmmakers, uh, I can tell them on my journey, it started with just doing something. Uh, if you're like, hey, I want to be a filmmaker. Now I just need a 10 million budget to go make my amazing film. It's like, no, what you need to do is go make a one minute film with your cell phone so that you can start learning the craft, you know, and do that yes. once a week or twice a week and keep going and study what successful shows are doing. I, I will admit that I do this sometimes. The successful shows that are out there in the 30 minute time, uh, time slot like Vindication is that are dramas, I will watch them and say, Okay, how many locations do they have? How are how are they telling this story? What's happening? What you know? What are the action sequences? What are the low moments? Where does the music come in? Because it's successful because people enjoy it, and if that's the way they're doing it, then you can certainly learn from it. And what'll happen is you're not copying because when you go do it for yourself, it'll turn out completely different that you couldn't tell. Oh, they must have looked at this other show. But but look at what people are doing that's successful. It's how we learn, right? You when you have a yeah. teacher, they're telling you. They're telling you how things work, and then you're picking up on that. So it's the same thing with watching uh, other shows. So keep making stuff and watch watch what's successful. And finally, Jared, how can fans follow you on social media? So we're, we are most active on Facebook, uh, Vindication Series, and Instagram as well, Vindication Series. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll post stuff, especially right now with the, the series coming out. We're 
uh, very, very active. And once the episodes are coming out, we'll probably be doing some some Facebook lives and talking about different things. You know, even when we're in production season, uh, casting opportunities and things, uh, crew opportunities, we'll post on those platforms as well. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I, I I'm I cannot wait for episode one of season two to drop. Uh, Christopher Sean Shaw. Hey, what's going on, buddy? Christopher Sean Shaw, who directed Church People that stars Michael Monks and Andriana Manfredi and some awesome actors. The Baldwin brothers are in it. Check that film out. I'm going to have Christopher Sean Shaw on September 20th uh, on the Maurice Brown Show, and we'll talk more about that. But right now we've got Jared O'Flaherty, and he's here talking about season two that's going to drop on september 1st on pure flicks ladies and gentlemen if you have enjoyed watching this please like it and share it and subscribe to the maurice brown comedy channel on youtube and any social media engine that my main man jared o'flaherty is a part of and also if you came in at the very end and you're like i missed it by gosh i missed it well, not really, because by midday tomorrow, around about, you can see the entire show in its entirety on the Creative Motion Network on Roku TV with Jared O'Flaherty. Jared, thanks again so much. And Jared, hang out. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you offline. Yeah. Well, but before Jared, we go, Maurice, before yeah. we go, on behalf of all the vindicators, now that's the term that we use for, for our cast and crew members. <laughs> Vindies are the fan, vindicators are the cast and crew. But on behalf of all of them, I just want to say thank you for the support and encouragement and promotion that you have given. Uh, I, I haven't sent you a check ever. I uh, haven't uh, <laughs> uh, called and said, hey, will you start doing this? You've done it on your own accord based on what you watch. And all of us are just greatly appreciative you know the fact that we got to do a season two and and hopefully that we get to keep going uh is you know owes you a debt of gratitude in, in small part or no, in no small part for what you have done in in promotion so thank you for that absolutely jared uh, absolutely and it, it's been a pleasure and an honor having you on the show and just watching your show it's so inspiring and i i just can't wait for the seasons to come, not just season two, just like LeBron James said in Miami when he got up with Dwayne, Dwayne Wade, not three, not four, not five, not six, not six. You remember that? So I just hope we just keep going on and on and on with the seasons, Jared. Prayerfully, that will happen because God's doing an amazing work through your uh, filmmaking. Yeah, um, I think that's the hope of, of all of us as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Jared O'Flaherty, filmmaker of Vindication and Season 2 dropping September 1st on Pure Flix. Don't miss it. Jared, may the peace of Jesus Christ, my friend, be with you and your family. God bless you. Hey, God bless you, too.